Hello, everyone, and welcome to this bite-sized research data webinar, the first of two that we have. My name is Sean Lacey. I'm the Research Integrity and Compliance Officer from Munster Technological University, and I'm delighted to be joined by Teresa Hearn, our Metadata and Research Data Librarian, who's going to speak to us on how to anonymize, pseudonymize, and de-identify your research data. Where the idea to, I suppose, this, this these webinars, the two webinars came from, uh, is, is building on what we were doing in towards the end of uh, 2023, where there was three web bite-sized research data webinars facilitated. Uh, feedback on these were very uh, positive, and there was an ask for more. And that's where, the, I suppose, the two that we've planned for today and next week have come from. So the ones that we've facilitated previous, and again, very much uh, these, these would have been led by Trace, or how to password protect your research data, how to encrypt your research data, how to store and share your research data securely and on an open data repository. So these are very much kind of practical type uh, webinars, is, which is essentially how to, so kind of helping you to kind of implement good practice. Um, when it comes to the focus for today's webinar, which is around anonymizing, pseudo-anonymizing, de-identifying research data, Therese myself said, thought it would be just useful to maybe give a description to what do we mean by anonymize, pseudo-anonymize, and de-identify. So when it comes to anonymize, this is where we've collected research data that does not contain any personable or identifiable information. Okay, and the, a classic example, and this, this, this is just only an example as a reference point, would be an anonymous survey. Okay, now I do put a bit of a caveat to that. If we have, have an anonymous survey and we've loads of demographic questions in it, there is a potential of maybe isolating who a person actually is in that case, if we have a small sample size but uh, or a population size. But I mean, in its most general terms, this is what anonymous would actually be. Pseudonymous is where you would have maybe identifiable information about your participants and you would look at replacing that identified uh, information, whether it be characteristics or whatever, with a pseudonym. That's where you're looking at pseudonymizing your data. Examples that you'd have here is where you might have, uh, where you would look at, maybe you'd have transcripts from interviews, interviews or focus groups, and you'd put in pseudonyms for place names or for when, other, uh, when a particular person might be mentioned and so on like that. De-identify then is very close to be pseudonymous. Okay, so de-identify is kind of a similar idea, except it's irreversible. It's kind of essentially where you're nearly redacting. Now there's a few different ways of doing it, but I mean, just say if you'd have a particular name in a transcript that you'd black out that name or you delete it completely. That's the idea of de-identifying. And I suppose the, they're very close pseudonymizing and de-identifying, but I suppose the idea with de-identifying is it is completely irreversible. So it's like deleting something completely. And then there's no base, no track record of it whatsoever. Okay. And then I suppose it's just with, like, these are the three that we're going to be looking at today. And very, I've obviously been led out by trays, but just to maybe kind of say, look, well, if if that we have an idea to what anonymous, pseudonymize, the identify is, well, what's identifiable then? Well, identifiable is where you have your data allows a participant to be identified. S simplest way is you might have a video recording. Remember now data is a very broad term to what data is, especially what our research data is. And if you're carrying out videos, uh, have a video recording and we have participants and you can see their faces, then that basically means your data now is identifiable, okay? And then there's a, this other term called potentially identifiable. So this is where, if we look at the idea of a transcript, or focus groups so we might have multiple participants and what we do is instead of the call using participants name of mary john we give them identifiers so participant one participant two and we might have a code or a key somewhere that maps participant one is mary participant two is john but that's stored somewhere separate to what your transcript is but the fact that there is a key and then there's kind of your uh your um the label that you're using, the fact that the both of them exist, if they ever came together, your data will be identifiable. So that's where you have this idea of potentially identifiable. It doesn't matter whether we'll say the key was stored in America and we have our transcripts here in Ireland. The fact that there is a key out there somewhere makes your data potentially identifiable. So that's kind of the idea to this. And I suppose where we see a lot of this actually happening for us is in the human research ethics uh, application forms. So as part of the human research ethics application forms, we've, we've two forms within the university. We have a minimal risk and full ethical review. Both forms have this table that you see here. And this is where we're looking at, look, what type of data are you actually collecting? And what, what format is the data in when you collect it? 
okay? And what format is the data going to be in when you store it at a later point? So it's not uncommon that you might collect data where your data, is, when it's collected, your participants are identifiable. So you might tick identifiable there, but then you're going to do something with your data to ma make it anonymous or make it pseudo-anonymous. And that's that's essentially what Charese is going to do. So we're going to, we're obviously focusing on the first two aspects here about how to anonymize, how to de-identify, how to pseudo-anonymize your data whereby your data might be an identifiable format when you've collected it, okay? It's important to know that you don't collect data pseudonymized. You make your data, you pseudonymize your data. You don't collect data de-identified. You de-identify your data. So it's, we, do you know what they collect, collected section there? You, we generally wouldn't be ticking pseudonymize or de-identified for collecting. If you, that could be how you'd be storing your data. Okay, so identifying is maybe how you've collected it. Pseudo anonymize is then how it's going to be stored. And what we what would be important then to map out in a human research edX application form is well, how do you plan on pseudo anonymizing your data? How do you plan on de identifying your data if it's required? And that's essentially what Trace is going to help us with here today as well. Okay, so this is just I suppose giving a, a I suppose setting the scene to what do we consider cons, cons, uh, I suppose what are our definitions for the various types of data formats, and then why are these are of interest to us, and where one example of where they'd be of interest of or the the application of it would be our human research ethics application forms. So then it's very much over to Therese now here to show us how to anonymize, soon anonymize, and de-identify our research data. Over to you, Therese. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Sean. Oh, I'm just going to share my screen there. Okay, so, um, yeah, so thank you, Sean, for uh, going through the definitions there. It allows us to um, go straight into the how-tos here. So um, this is a bite-sized session. Um, it's great for engagement, but um, I suppose it does mean that we won't be able to, we won't have time to go into the nitty-gritty um, of each um of each method um of of the 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 three main um items that we're going to talk about today um but uh we can carry on with uh why we're we're talking about this this webinar today and um the reality is is that we are um above all we're we're guided by the legislation and we need to adhere to the legislation and people in the EU EU have a fundamental right to privacy which means that um, when we are carrying out research related in any way to human subjects, um, those research subjects um, over and above uh, have a right to privacy. Um, and, um, sorry. Um, so, uh, so when carried out effectively, anonymization and pseudonymization and de-identification can be used to protect the privacy rights of individual data subjects, while um, we as researchers need to um, you know, balance this right uh, to privacy um, against our legitimate goals for research and hence the methods um, that we're going to talk about today. Um, so again, um, what is personal data um, that we need to uh, ensure is, is anonymized and de-identified um, when making our, um, our, our data available? Um, and this is any information relating to the data subject, um, including the obvious ones, such as your, your name, your ID number, location data, and so on, um, but also physical, physiological, genetic, um, mental, economic, cultural, um, social identity, perhaps. Um, and I suppose uh, this is the point where I would ask you maybe to keep in your head um, uh, perhaps a, a, a a project subject, um, a data subject akin to um, a six foot seven um, basketball player living in Leitrim um, that's, you know, come from Albania with with Albanian citizenship. So, um, you know, there's there's lots there that um, that could possibly identify uh, such a data subject amongst um, you know, what would understood, be understood to be um, a more general uh, uh, public, really, uh, in relation to, 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 those, to those traits. 
so we'll we'll speak a bit more about that um and we'll uh, we'll pick on our um Al Albanian really tall uh, basketball player living in Leitrim throughout uh this session so um the main risks again that that, that the european commission has identified um in uh th that we want to avoid um and um that that we're going to apply our, our techniques to avoid our singling out so is it possible to isolate records which identify an individual in the data set um is it possible that we could that that an attacker perhaps could link at least two records concerning the same data subject or a group of data subjects um using our database um our data set or or perhaps different publicly available or otherwise um, databases, or is it possible to infer um, who somebody might be um, or where they might be or so on? Um, is it possible to deduce the value of an attribute um, from our from our data set um, uh, to, to apply to the identity um, of somebody? Um, so Moving on then, the techniques um, that we can actually apply uh, to, um, at the end of the day, anonymize our data. So, um, you know, ensuring that, that, that our data set is actually anonymous is the requirement for it to, um, to fall outside of the, the requirements of GDPR. Um, and this these are randomization and generalization. So these are the understood uh, methods of, of anonymization. Um, randomization is a family of techniques that alters the data. And what we want to do is cut the link between the individual and the data without losing the value of the data, um, of course. So, um, and if we can, you know, do that in such a way uh, that the data are, are, are uncertain, essentially they can't, um, they won't refer to a specific data subject, a, an individual. Um, so we spoke about our three risks um, and this will hopefully reduce the risk of inference from anonymized data as well as um, reduce the potential for data matching between data sets. Unless, of course, other available data sets use the same randomized values. So, um, you know, we could have publicly available um, data sets relating to, say, um, you know, census voting records, addresses and so on. Um, and that um, uh, so ways of, of minimizing those risks can be um, using additional techniques, so other randomization techniques, um, other anonymization techniques, pseudonymization, and combining those together to ensure that we're, we're cutting that link between the individual and the data. Um, other anonymization techniques include generaliz generalization, and this can um, this this essentially reduces the granularity of our data. So only less precise data is disclosed. So we could be talking about, um, say, we're talking about location data. Um, we would have somebody, um, you know, we we could call our column Cork as opposed to Ballincollig or Bishopstown. Um, likewise, you know, we can we can increase the 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 we can reduce the granularity of that data. Um, so we can talk about days. Um, uh, we can talk about months. Um, um, year year of birth rather than date of birth, and so on. Um, so within randomization, then, um, so we have something called noise addition. Um, and this can modify attributes in our data set such that they're less accurate, um, but whilst retaining the overall distribution, if that's something that we're looking for. Um, so if that, you know, if that maintains the integrity uh, of, of our project, really what, what we're aiming to do. So again, we're coming back to our, our basketballer living in Leitrim. So if, if say height was originally measured to the nearest centimeter, um, the anonymized data set, um, you know, we may add noise to uh, to bring that height accurate to say plus or minus 10 centimeters. OK, and um, 
at which point then um, there's going to be, you're going to get a, a greater number of subjects um, within that range. Um, and uh, again, we're all coming to the point where where um, a third party or an attacker would not be able to identify that individual. So, um, you know, we're using these methods to, to, to de-identify essentially and anonymize. Um, and also within that, that any attacker wouldn't be able to, uh, you know, go back essentially and repair the data um, as they wouldn't know how it would have been modified. Um, so, um, you know, hopefully these, these are techniques that, that could be useful uh, for your research. Um, and again, an added caveat nearly with all of these techniques that, that noise addition will common and commonly need to be combined with other techniques. Um, and usually, especially the removal of obvious attributes and quasi-identifiers, um, you know, such as your name, uh, locations, and so on, and minimizing the data to what we only absolutely need. Um, permutation then, shuffling the values of attributes in a table. So essentially, um, as you know, it might not sound like best practice, but what we're doing is, is we are swapping um, data attributes within a table. So we are maintaining the exact distribution of each date of each attribute within the data set. But again, we are, you know, we're cutting that link um and um going towards full anonymization um as much as possible um and again should be combined uh with the the removal of of obvious attributes especially uh where possible and data minimization um differential privacy then is essentially it's just it's just uh, i suppose a subsection of noise addition where um we can um add noise a different noise depending on who's requesting the information and this would be added say after the fact um so uh you know depending so if if two people request the information we may add different types of noise um again all with the ultimate aim of preserving privacy so um Again, look these these techniques. I'll, I'll I'll show you the references um at at the end of the session, as to where we can you know where you can go into more detail a lot more detail into these techniques. Generalization techniques then, um probably uh the the most well known is aggregation and K non anonymity anonymity. Um, these prevent a data subject from being singled out by grouping them with, say, at least K um, number of other individuals. So, um, uh, again, a widely known one is to say, for example, with, with ages, we'll have a band of ages as opposed to dates of birth or actual ages um, for our individual data subjects. So, you know, we'll have our 35 to 45 age group and so on. Um, all leading to the fact that the higher the value of K, the stronger um, the, the privacy guarantees there for our data subjects. Um, and uh, of course, so so these can be read into in more detail, and then you can um, you can be absolute experts in um, answering that question uh, that that Sean showed in his slide for your uh, data ethics applications, um, and it'll be absolutely no bother to you. Um, L diversity and T closeness. Again, look, these are I'm not going to go into them in too much detail. These are extensions of of K and anon anonymity um, so that, again, we are removing the risk of linking data. We're removing the list of attackers making um, those inferences and um, and, uh, you know, possibly identifying our our data subjects by combining, you know, however many databases or, or um, whatever way they 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 might do it, but it's all about us describing how we are reducing the risk and increasing the anonymity, um, of our data subjects, um. So just just a just kind of a Venn diagram, um, illustration there below, on how you could possibly. Um, you know, using limited information 
um, in fact, identify data subjects um, utilizing other pieces of information and, um, you know, putting them together, possibly like a jigsaw. Um, so on to pseudonymization then. So um, this is replacing one attribute, typically a unique attribute, in a record by another. So as Sean talked about, you know, a code or a key. Um, so um, if that key exists, um, so so if the, the code book exists where, where we have the translation of that attribute or, or of those attributes available somewhere, the natural person is still likely to be identified indirectly. Um, and um, so pseudonymization when used alone will not result in an anonymous or an anonymized data set, which is what we are, are looking for. So again, we need to look at um, what are the risk factors involved with my particular data set, with my particular subject in the context um, in which I'm doing this, uh, this research and what can we do to um, to you know minimize the data that we have to use and anonymize it as much as possible and, and de-identify it um however pseudonymization is especially useful in things like longitudinal studies um or for per uh, or for purposes where it's necessary to link data collected at different times um so you know you might be doing a subject on um students um results perhaps and then you want to look at those over time you want to look at them the next year and so on um but yeah look combining that with other techniques um in some circumstances hopefully you know in 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 yours can lead to to successful anonymized data um and um you know allow us to 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 carry on with it with our uh, with our research um with the you know, uh, with that that data integrity in place. Um, so again, just to reiterate, I've put it in twice. So given that individuals can still be singled out with pseudonymization, pseudonymization should never be considered an effective means of anonymization, especially on its own, um, but can be considered a security enhancing measure um, to reduce the data set's linkability. OK, um, and uh, techniques include their look encryption with a secret key, as we spoke about earlier. We can have a hash function, um, so a function which returns a fixed size output from an input of any size um, and cannot be reversed. Um, so uh, it's just it's an addition really to encryption with a secret key, uh, the reversal risk uh, with encryption here no longer exists. However, and there's always an however with all of these methods, uh, which is why, um, you know, uh, putting them on top of each other can all can 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 often be the solution uh, to anonymization. Um, uh, so um, the, the range of input values, the hash function are known and um, they can be replayed through the hash function in order to derive the correct value for a particular record. Um, in the resources that um, I'm going to show you um, in, in a couple of minutes, um, these are spoken about in, in more detail and, you know, and there are, you know, there's lots of resources to go into these in more detail. Um, and uh, probably in the vast majority of cases we wouldn't need to 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 utilize these hopefully if we can if we can minimize our data and um, that we're using to only what is absolutely necessary um uh you know we can we can hopefully avoid the use of a lot of these particularly um complicated uh uh, methods of anonymization and um, again so look uh, you know we've got um, we've got other methods there keyed hash function and so on we can talk about salting data and so on in in, in this um, in this context um, and uh, we can talk about tokenization um, just an example there is the the financial industry would utilize this to replace an ID number with a randomly generated number um, that's not mathematically derived from the original data. It's it's you essentially ask a computer to to um, randomly generate a number, and that's you know that's going to be your um, your key essentially. Um, and all of these are are to reduce the risks that we that we spoke about earlier in the session. 
Um, again, I'm just, you know, I just put this slide up here, uh, probably for more for future reference. Um, that if you're, you know, if you're looking into these methods, um, just to show how overlapping them is probably the best method of um of of getting final anonymization and acceptable anonymization um uh for your for your data sets um and uh yeah again look the you know i'll show you the resources to go into that in more detail um and i suppose um as an umbrella message um before we go on to those resources is Anonymization best practice is essentially do not rely on the release and forget approach. Um, you know, uh, your your data really, um, and through your planning, uh, and through your ethics applications and so on, um, it should really be kind of an organic practice, uh, throughout the research cycle. So, um, you know. We need to be looking at identifying new risks, possibly, and reevaluating the residual risks of identification regularly. So perhaps new technologies might come on board. You know, AI possibly being a big one, and and the, you know as as we get ever closer to to that becoming, um, you know, more usable and and perfected, um, you know, technology that might not exist now may exist in the future that could possibly identify our um what we thought was 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 anonymous um our anonymized data sets we need to assess whether the controls for identified risks suffice and adjust accordingly um and monitor and control the risks um which is why having you know a data management plan um uh, uh in in relation to to all of your data sets before, during, and after your um your project has been completed, um is is the best way of keeping on top of this quickly and reliably. Um, should anybody need to uh you know to audit this or 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 look into this, um and you yourself. So um, our resources really that 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 we utilize today. Um, sorry, I thought that slide was a bit better. Um, we use the guidance on anonymization and pseudonymization um, from the Data Protection Commission. Um, uh, kind of went straight to the source there. Um, it's GDPR that uh, we all wish to comply with. Um, so, um, you know, that's 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 the resource I use, utilize there. There's guides within there and then there's guides on guides. Um, to uh to, to you know to help us go through this they they they're very relevant to research um as well so um uh have a look at the the data protection commission website if you um if you're so inclined and um uh the kind of the the opinion recommendations files so a lot of the the working examples that I got there come from um, the Data Protection Working Party document um, that the European Commission have also produced, um, but that's available uh, through the, the Data Protection Commission website as well. Um, and of course, um, all of this, uh, this, this session comes with the caveat that um, the reason why I'm giving it from a library point of view is from um, an information literacy and a research methods point of view um, and uh, pointing you in the right direction of the, you know, the, the correct literature uh, to look at for this. But the reality is, um, you know, you you would need to have your um your your anonymization and your 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 data privacy and and your data suitability looked at through um the 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 human research ethics uh form that Sean's department looks after um and and the ethics committee they are the only ones that can sign off on um you know whether whether your 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 research um does uh, comply with you know university policies and, and legislation and so on and of course we have our freedom of information officer carmel hayes as well um who can advise specifically on on any gdpr um concerns um so yeah um 
so that's where we we are um and i suppose just one last point on all of this is that kind of ever before you begin to collect your data data minimization and um only utilizing as much data as is as is possible for you to achieve your research aims is is the best way to to carry on with this so only collect as much data as you need um and um you know it can avoid uh hopefully um um a lot of a lot of work obviously there will be you know studies where where you will need to um possibly look at um at personal data and anonymizing it and you know being very strict on data security and so on but if you can if you can have data minimization um and um the the most efficient way to 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 ensure your data subjects privacy at the top of your um agenda then um hopefully that you know it'll, it it can make things things more efficient um as as you work through um your your data ethics and your uh, and and ensuring um that everything is above board that way okay so that's all for me um do we have time for questions sean yeah th thanks very much uh trace that that was very informative um i think just maybe look as yes, maybe some people may be thinking of questions just one just to follow up the data minimization because that was a very important point mm -hmm. it's it's something that's actually called out in our university's human research ethics policy is and it's a principle of the whole research process that we don't just collect data for the sake of it like every the data that we should have and how i'd always look at it is the data i should collect everything should have a purpose and if I think of look, the purpose of collecting the data is and how does this align with my research hypotheses or my research questions, then that helps align with the data minimization principles. Because if I if we don't want to be kind of going down the road, oh, oh I, I'll ask that question because that could be of interest. That, I may want to look at that because that doesn't really help with the data minimization principle. I suppose my thinking often to that would be any question I ask in relation to data gathering should have a purpose and I should have a plan for that at the start and that all comes down to having that plan at the start as well and it's just it's just it was uh, interesting that you that's what you close off with because what i would written down here is it is actually a principle that's called out in our research and human research ethics uh policy um does, is there any questions from anyone there's definitely one or two it was quite interesting the the k anonymity and the different uh the l diversity i think it was uh mm -hmm. what was l sorry it was the L I mean, I hadn't heard of some of those, you know, which yeah, is really I'm better, interesting. I'm better, I'm better on K now, but uh, L, yeah. I'd have to go. I'd, I'd have to go back. So it's so it's an ascent. It's it's so I suppose it's um it's making sure that your K is 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 correct. It's it's an extent. Yeah. It's an extension of the um of the you know K K, which is your number essentially your number yeah. um of of data subjects that you want to adhere to that you want to to keep your range um within so um yeah it it just i think i think it just kind of um it it just it it, it refines that um to to make it more useful um and, and yeah okay so then a question so and this is just to make sure that my my thought process here is correct so mm -hmm. we collect data where we'll say participants are identifiable. So we've collected identifiable data. Yeah. Then the next step then is we want to anonymize it or pseudonymize it or de-identify it. We do one of those yeah. steps. Yeah. And then we analyze. So I think like it's important that I mean I might correct in saying this that we're not analyzing the identifiable data because I'm trying to think of that reproducibility. How do we reproduce our results? So if anybody wanted to reproduce our results, they can only reproduce the results of the anonymized or the pseudonymized data. Yes, because that's so, that that would be the only data that would be that would be available. Um yes. this this would be the only data that we could make publicly available and therefore available for other researchers to use. So I suppose the, the processing of um of raw data or or the anonymization or pseudonymization of the data is processing it in itself. Um, and again, you know, that this is more your department, but again, that that would need to to be um to be uh I suppose addressed in in any um permissions 
um, that you'd be giving to your to your data subjects, uh, you know, permission forms. Um, so we'd be processing the raw identifiable data um, to to become, um, you know, more randomized, more generalized. Um, yeah. yeah, is is that? No, no that that's absolutely no, no. And that I suppose, like, if I suppose my thinking is, when, like, we think of that human resource ethics table that we put up there earlier, that's in the table from the application form, is the stored data that we have. That's the data that we're analyzing. Yes. Okay, so I mean, like, and it's not saying that you can't analyze identifiable data, uh -huh. but there's a lot more control needs around that than if we're going to be storing data that where participants are identifiable. Like that is a concern, and how we minimize that concern is by following the steps then that Trace has outlined here. Yeah, yeah. So again, as you said, Sean, if if you wish to make your your study and and the data that went into your study reproducible. Um, the the analysis um would would need to be carried out on the the satisfactorily anonymized data yeah that's great Trace thanks very much I just see that there was a question there about the slides yes they will be shared we'll be sharing the the recording in the slides so the the slides will be available from the source so that the link was popped into the chat there um and to, to, I just there's one question there and just I'll just so I'll, I'll call it out there if that's okay. So thank you for the excellent set and informative presentations. Should or could this information become a reusable learning object to inform undergraduate students and supervisors or where it might otherwise be available is, is such a nice summarized format. It is very topical to the types of undergrad research I'm taking in several departments. Um, yeah, yeah, I suppose yeah. we can, yeah, we can, we can make that, that available. I probably, I mean, I'd like to spend more time on it, making making it more engaging. Um, but yeah, um, that's probably a, a conversation that 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 we should have, Sean. Um, yeah, like there, there's a body of work with that, but I think that that's something that's very useful because obviously our students, whether it be undergraduate students or postgraduate students, and even then their supervisors, they we do we do collect data where participants yeah. are potentially identifiable. And it's where our maybe we are just identifiable actually. Yeah. And then it's important, no matter what level, as in whether we're doing undergraduate research as part of an undergraduate study or research part of a postgraduate study or staff doing research, that that data is managed correctly. So uh, I think maybe this is kind of a starting point to maybe that. But I think like Trey said at the start, with these bite-size webinars, they can't cover everything. But I, I think that's an interesting point mentioned there. And something definitely we could look at following up maybe resources around that even or something yeah definitely yeah thanks thanks yeah. for uh, for bringing that up actually yeah that's something yeah. for us to think about yeah brilliant okay so look thanks very much Therese uh, I think I have one more sl slide just to pop up here just where are we at the moment so today's session was about how to anonymize pseudo anonymize and de-identify your research data Therese would have mentioned about having a research data management plan towards the end of her presentation to kind of say look when you, this will be part, this will be the process of anonymizing, pseudo anonymizing or de-identifying will be something that you would mention in a research data management plan. And next week, we actually, Trace will be leading out on a webinar focused on how to create a research data management plan. So hopefully, uh, if you find this of interest, that you might come back to us next week and we'll, um, a Trace will outline how to create a research data management plan. Thanks very much, Trace. Thanks very much, everyone. And uh, we'll see you next time. All the best. Thanks a million, Sean. Thank you.